Well, um, good evening, everybody, and thanks very much for coming all the way down to the grass tent, which is a fair long way from the big top, so very appreciative, and it's really exciting to be here and to talk about landscape architecture and farming, uh, which is a big passion of Kim uh, and I's. Um, just to introduce ourselves, um, I'm Toby Diggins, and a, a landscape architect, and this is Kim Wilkie, also a landscape architect, and we're both farmers as well. We live in different sort of slight climatic regimes of, of England, but share a love of cattle. And um, we're going to talk to you tonight, really just sort of tell some stories about how our work as landscape architects is is really fascinating at the moment and how um, thinking about the landscape in a in a very broad sense can can often be a very resilient and powerful thing for the land so the image you see here is our um, or two of our cows in Devon we've got a herd of 23 pedigree red Devons uh, on the farm and since we started farming it my wife Bella and I we've been um, essentially sort of regeneratively grazing it in this very complex but really highly interesting fashion and the farm is where my studio is based and we um, we basically use the farm as a test bed for the work that we do which is um, really starting to give us a huge amount of insight into how to manage landscapes that are very balanced and very per perpetual and we're going to both talk about those kind of landscapes tonight and how to look at the landscape and understand the sort of natural flow of the landscape across Britain. Um, but just before we do that, I'm going to just quickly preface the the work that we do and, and sort of why I think the way I do, because I think it's important to understand, you know, how do we get to where we have got to in the British landscape and where do we go in the future? And of course, regenerative agriculture and other methods which you know, we're so enlighteningly here, uh, hearing today are, are sort of a big part of that. So from, a, from a, a human perspective, you know, we walked out of this phenomenally complex landscape uh, in Africa and spread out across the world. And, um, and slowly but surely over hundreds of thousands of years from this hyper complex landscape, which is very, very biologically resilient and has, you know, deep soil structure and all of the things that you're hearing about in lots of talks today, we have kind of perpetuated a, a, a new method, which is to you know create this unbelievably um, complex but very human-dominated uh, urban systems, which actually the agriculture that we have primarily today is is sort of um, essentially supplying. And um, uh, as far as I sort of perceive the landscape, you know these these urban systems are, are, are quite parasitic. And to move forward in time, we need both our, our agricultural landscapes and our cultural landscapes, which are left, to actually become um, much more perpetual and much more symbiotic. And so to sort of move on to how we look at landscape and how we think about designing landscapes, it's actually you know, fairly simple in, in, um, in my eyes. Landscapes are, are made up of many, many elements, but, but three crucial things kind of stand out to me, which if you're thinking about looking at your, your landscapes, it's, it's worth maybe starting with. Um, the first is obviously the geology and how how geology and then the soils which geology creates are um, are going to un underpin how how that landscape has been has been created over time. Um, and then the topography that overlies that, so the folds and the undulations in the landscape will essentially uh, allow one to be able to farm in a certain type of way. Um, and by being sympathetic with topography, um, one can obviously farm in a very resilient way. And finally, uh, climate. So whether you're in the, the Alps or whether you're in the, the, the plains of, of Hertfordshire, for example, you've got very different constraints of climate, which end up and have ended up creating the landscapes that we see today. And so now I'm just going to quickly go through some you know, fascinating landscapes to me, which which show off the types of um, almost decision-making processes that, that are being made by people over thousands and thousands of years and, um, and how you know, those landscapes have become a certain way and whether they're you know, beneficial or whether they're um, 
not necessarily beneficial to the overall kind of resilience of an e of an ecosystem. So this is, um, in many cases, what a lot of us would see if we went up in a plane and looked over much of sort of lowland Britain, this amazing patchwork of, of land, which is, on a topographical sense, relatively flat and therefore quite easy to farm. And as a consequence, as we've moved into this more industrial method of agriculture, most of the kind of interwoven and balanced elements of landscape, which once were probably here, like lowland hay meadows and small pieces of copse and woodland, have slowly but surely been moved on. And we now have this exceptionally arably dominated landscape, within which, of course, things like soils have, have generally been eroded. And so what we need to be thinking about is how do we sort of reconnect these landscapes and how do we actually bring them to a position of resilience within their own area of ecosystem, rather than requiring a wilder or more natural ecosystem somewhere else, somewhere far away, to be delivering all of what landscapes need to deliver for us, which evidently is not just food. So this is a, a really interesting landscape for me, um, and I've labelled um, the types of, of, of landscape uses which have gone on in this landscape, and topography and climate have really influenced how this landscape over over about 10,000 to 20,000 years have been, um, ha has changed. So on the, I think it would be the right to you, there's a, a downland landscape where the, the topography as well as the climate has meant that people have retained a pastoral element to, um, to the way that things are farmed. And as a consequence, there's incredible biodiversity left on that landscape. The central part of this, um, of this map is a terrace and the, the outwash of the lime-rich soils that goes down into that terrace, as well as pre-drainage, a lot of um, you know, depth to the soil has meant that they've been perpetually used in, in, in arable systems. And then to the, to the left of, this, um, of the map, you can see a, a strong escarpment, and this is where people have chosen over, over thousands of years to retain woodland, because a lot of the, um, the difficulties of, of mechanizing sort of farming steep slopes has been left alone and as a consequence you have these amazing seams of um, more perpetual landscapes that have been retained and in the case of this particular image actually this is a, I think a, an amazingly kind of balanced position to be in unfortunately the arable land is quite intensively managed but from a from a resilience perspective because there are still livestock in the landscape working the pastoral systems and coming back to the barns every winter you are still seeing a kind of maintained fertility on land which has been farmed actually for certainly well over a thousand years as far as the research we, we did um, was concerned. And so then, um, just because I think it's really fascinating to consider um, these very kind of resilient landscapes, I was just in the floodplain meadows talk and um, we're talking very similarly about landscapes where there's a, an amazing amount of, of, of cultural resilience and cultural richness and a and a kind of set of knowledge, um, set of, of, of understanding of a landscape. This is actually the Alps in France. This is a, a really well-known um, goat's cheese um, and goat farming operation. And through essentially what most of us would class as mob grazing, but the, the goat herd would just be like, well, this is what we do. Every three days, they move these goats across these unbelievably rich alpine meadows. And on the right-hand side, you can see that there's a team of cattle doing the same amount, uh, doing the same thing. Every day, they get milk twice a day, just like um, just like dairies up and down the country. And yet, the result after the animals leave is just this completely and utterly unbelievable, um, resilient landscape with unbelievable biodiversity and. To see this and, and to recognize that actually a massive amount of Britain probably was once like this, and it may not have been quite so floristically intense, but the, the, the opportunity for us with our, with our farm systems to see landscape in this way is, is there for us to, um, to take. And it's something that on our farm we've, we've, we've definitely recognized since starting from a very low baseline as, a, as an as a, a sort of intensive dairy operation with lots and lots of silage cutting. And so to move now into just some, some projects that we're in the middle of and, and to sort of tell the story of how we see what we see and, um, and why we've made the decisions we've made, uh, this is a, a, a smaller project that was on a floodplain in the River Torridge. And this is a digital terrain model which was made by somebody doing a drone overflight, which 
is unbelievably useful to to us now. I feel like and, you know, the sort of lidar capacity that is is out there is is actually pretty much available to everybody. So I'd highly recommend if you get the chance and you're looking at your farm to to look at lidar and um, we use GIS, geographical information systems, to kind of overlay lots of different layers of the landscape. But but topography, which uh, Kim will also talk a lot about, is is such a crucial thing. And and also the sort of hidden topography, which is left as a as a skeleton or as a as a remnant of what was what was once, um, is is absolutely vital to for us to understand. In some cases, how we create a logic of what to do next because you could do theoretically at, in this time and in this age absolutely anything you could you could take machines to anything and move entire mountains if you want to but does the does the landscape want you to do that and and how might it reset if you were to be you know marginally more more sensitive um but at the same time potentially artistic because our forebears have have you know moved earth to change landscapes and so it seems logical that you know we shouldn't shy away from that at the same time. I think what's really fascinating about this to me is, uh, and I hope everybody can see it on the screen, is that you've got the river Torridge that goes along the top side of the screen and sort of bends down into that meander at the bottom. And the, the blue color is essentially the lowest parts of, the, um, of this landscape. And, and, and what's happened is over time, people have wanted to get out onto the floodplain, which is actually orange and remarkably much higher than the river itself. And when we look back at the history of this, it was it was being um, once upon a time used to grow potatoes because, of course, next to a river, you've got amazingly deep soils. But slowly but surely, the amount of uh, drainage which has happened across most of the rest of the Torridge catchment has actually led the river to become very incised. And when it does flood, as we were just hearing from other um, people who are experiencing floodplains, uh, the floods are actually much more severe. And of course, the land became much, much harder to farm. And slowly but surely, this land is essentially going back to a, a, a much more natural landscape. But what we decided to do was to to look at it so that you know we become resilient and that, and to move this particular project away from being all about uh, some kind of farming operation and to move it into a, a flood restoration and flood mitigation operation, where we mapped out using that topography, which you can see. Um, I might just go over here and help you can kind of see that there's these old flow trains where the original um, where the original river probably was braided. And of course, the best place to start thinking about re-wetting a landscape is where you've got these undulations in the landscape which are already lower. So when you push the water back across its floodplain and reactivate the floodplain and get those kind of amazing peaty soils building back up again, you're going to start to get the water following those natural courses. So it seemed illogical to us to actually you know push the water where it shouldn't go in this particular case and um, what we then did is we kind of modeled how how that particular floodplain might work in in positions of low flow um, which is as as you see here and then also positions of high flow and then that would allow us to be able to understand where you'd get amazing op uh, opportunities for wading birds, where you could actually still continue to do a floodplain meadow restoration, which is the, the dotted areas, which would stay above the flooding. And um, as, a, as a sort of integrated ecological piece, this, uh, this particular project was going to then become a much more valuable entity to the overall catchment of the, of the Torridge. And that was the logic behind why we decided to, to design that. Um, Again, this is this is another project about about water for us. This is a master plan we did from a project in Norfolk. There's some unbelievably um, impressive uh, multi-designated sites on the southern side of this project, and the north is a very, very currently uh, intensively managed landscape. And as a consequence, there's a significant amount of of agricultural pollution which is entering these broads and and actually depleting the overall biodiversity of the broads. And um, through utilizing the concept of, uh, of potentially biodiversity net gain, although this is more about a long-term landscape restoration, we, we chose to push pieces of woodland along the more steep areas of topography, which linked up so that then we created this kind of interlocking um, matrix of woodland and hedgerows, which were starting to grow out. And then to go to a pastoral system because 
the depletion of the soil meant that there was ever increasing needs for nutrient use, uh, or particularly artificial nitrogen. And by um, by moving away from that and by going, especially on these soils are actually very sandy, we would get to a position where you once again would have this much more balanced landscape. And the, the, the really sort of crucial piece of value in this particular project was not the piece that we were suggesting to actually restore or change, but actually it was to stop the, uh, the ingress of these chemicals uh, going into the broads and as a consequence um, depleting what was basically a sort of internationally designated set of sites. Um, got about sort of five minutes to go, so I'll, I'll just go through one, one more project, um, which is, you know, for us, a, a, a super exciting project. Uh, this is the Wendling Beck Environment Project, and if you're in the, um, what was the talk? It was, it was about the soil food web. Uh, Rosie, Rosie Begg, who, who, who's regeneratively farming black currants, is, is one of the landowners here. And when we first came to see this landscape, fascinatingly, the idea was to kind of still use the um, original landowner boundaries to create small pockets of habitat richness, again, through potentially the concept of biodiversity net gain, but really from the idea that this, this landscape, again, really, really free draining, would, um, which, was, which was used previously for uh, intensive pig farming, was really in, in need of a, of a significant rest and for that kind of resilience to come back in. And as we looked at the history of it, we realized that there were significant areas of heathland and there were significant areas of grassland. As you can see through the very core of this project, there's this amazing spine of woodland, which is, a, which is all a triple SI. And actually the, the biggest blob of green at the sort of in the sort of top center is a totally man-made set of irrigation lakes which had been designated as a triple SI. So you know, once again, we were dealing with a cultural landscape that was very functional, which had then become incredibly biodiverse because of the fact that it was dug. And you know, if you ever want to get biodiversity on your farm, <laughs> you know, dig a pond. But the, the, when we first um, became involved in this project, it was, it was still very much based on the compartmentalization of land, which is something that's happened through enclosure. And, Enclosure is really only just this one sort of moment in time. And as we happened to come across, you know, one of the most amazing opportunities where there were five people, you know, utterly inspired to do something different and to join up five different farms, we ended up putting together this project, which is, as you can see, much more ecologically networked. And you can see that that central core of habitat has been retained and enhanced. One of the most interesting elements of this is that, I'll just go back to the map again because it's quite hard to see potentially. This, um, this sort of strip, this corridor, is, is actually going to be the, the Vattenfall uh, offshore wind cable coming across the whole of the, of the project. And knowing that this was going to become a, a pastorally based project to restore the soils, as well as lots of other different habitats, we realized that this, um, this Vattenfall cable, which was totally not my idea, but absolutely an amazing one, I thought would become the drove road that would be able to get the livestock from one side of it to the other. And you can see here, these little green striations are actually Rosie's amazing regenerative black currants. And so they sit within this landscape and are hopefully enhanced by it because the overall resilience of the landscape around the farming activities is so much more intact that there wouldn't be those kind of sudden pulses of, uh, of, of, of pests coming in. And as much as we've thought about the overall landscape and reintegrating it, we've thought about re-wiggling the rivers through the floodplain, reactivating those floodplains, but at the same time, not just thinking about letting them sort of go, but managing them in a way where they become exceptionally species rich, which is, which is really where I think we have a great opportunity. We've got mostly relatively small patches of land and we've got really great knowledge of how to manage land in really resiliently and biodiverse ways. And to sort of forget that, I think, is a, is, you know, is a huge, um, it would be a huge loss to farming because actually prior to the intensification of farming, we had these incredible systems, which as a, if anybody knows who, who, who manages wildflower meadows, for example, they are, they are utterly perpetual as long as you manage them right. And I just find that completely incredible. So, um, Final few slides, just because it's it's cool. This is a visualization we did to show the complexity of the landscape. 
and just um, one or two more. This is our home. These fields or this field was just rye grass, and in five years we've managed to transition it. Um, the bluebells were there, but um, managed to transition it to very, very species rich. And the majority of the work that is done that makes it like that is is these cows, um, and Bella and our dog Tui, because we work as a team and we work in harmony with the land, or at least we hope to. And I think that that's you know one of the things that we've been humbled by with our landscape at home is that. It wants to be something really, really powerfully rich. And it's only really us standing in the way of making it that. So we, um, we're exceptionally grateful to be able to work the land in this way and to see these remarkable gains so quickly. And to also know now that these, these gains are not things that would just come and go. They would be there forever if we stayed stable and you know stayed, stayed humble and stayed learning. So. Um, so that's that's really you know what what I get up to. So there you go. <laughs> I'm going to rattle through um, very much a similar theme, um, but uh, we want to leave time to be cross-examined afterwards. So please do give us questions. Um, but um, for me, landscape is geology eroded by water and then infused with life, human and wildlife. And, and I think the understanding that they're both together is intrinsic to this. And indeed, landscape, the landscapes we love, the most beautiful landscapes I find are the farmed landscapes. This is Egerton Hill and then Ridge and Furrow. Incredible shapes up in this um, very far north um, twilight zone where you get these long shadows and beautiful landscape that is from three, five thousand years of farming. And I think to understand that farming is landscape is the crucial, um, the, the crucial jump to make. And indeed, even with the enclosure movement, <laughs> the whole cultural uh, and um, uh, sort of essence of, of what it is, particularly in England, is formed by that agricultural and pastoral tradition. And indeed, at its most intense in the mid-18th century, farming was using every inch of, um, uh, of usable land, but for perpetual uh, fertility. Uh, and this, this uh, frontispiece shows windmills, um, sheep, hay, stew ponds, the whole lot. And um, the, uh, the ecologists, um, the Hampshire ecologists, did an, a study of when maximum biodiversity since the last ice age occurred. And it was probably in the mid-18th century when the land was being farmed for perpetual fertility, not 5,000 years ago. So human beings are a part of that biodiversity. And the English landscape movement through the 18th century um, was very much about bringing livestock and productive landscape right up to the edge of the house. This is um, Capabilities Brown's last plan before he died for Heveningham and the illustration of what the landscape would look like. And there were no flowers there. There were animals right up to the windows and then vegetables grown in the walled garden. And I think one has to remember that landscape at farming and, and looking beyond the fence, which I'll come to shortly, is... is um, is the essence of uh, where we go now and how we get government thinking and government funding to, to join up. This is Heveningham. Brown's plans were never implemented, but the top um, slide there is the, um, uh, the intense arable and erosion that was going on before we implemented Brown's plans. Um, this is around about 2000. And the biodiversity has exploded there as well as producing very good um, food. That's what it looks like now, and it's gone from pretty much a desert uh, in terms of wildlife into 50 breeding barn owl pairs there, um, and curlews and uh, incredible insects as well. And one of the big decisions to make um, at the moment is where to put trees. And, and I think really looking at topography, how it works with the land, is essential. 
on this project, we've now planted a million trees, but very much according to the topography and keeping the valleys and the water in the bottom of those valleys open. Along those same lines, um, this is a, a project in just close to Winchester, and it's within two arms of the Itchin, one of the best um, chalk streams in, in the world, and you can see the top, or the top left is uh, it had been turned into a polo pitch with a helipad. The top right is the medieval system of I intense water farming that used to take place there. Um, below that, the southern damselfly, which had almost gone extinct. And then um, bottom left is we persuaded the Environment Agency and the Wildlife Trust that we wouldn't take anything away from the site, we wouldn't bring anything in, but if we could just move the earth around, we could um, bring back the habitat for the southern damselfly, make it good for grazing and full of wildlife. And um, that, that's what it looks like now as you fly into Southampton Airport. And before we were there with diggers for three months, before um, we'd even finished, um, the otters, the damselflies, um, and, um, and the salmon had, had moved in. And it, it's just a question of you don't have to replicate what was there in the Middle Ages, but you have to understand the principles of how you work with the land and the floodplain. And it can be very much of our own time. So um, th those are the LIDAR demonstrations and, and the drawing of the plan. But what we just very much picked up from, as Toby said, from the last talk about floodplains is that uh, this is uh, a slide stolen from the Open University, but that deep-rooted herbal lays grazed properly in floodplains sequester carbon faster and more successfully than any woodland or any other form of um, uh, management of the land. So cows and herbal lays are intrinsic to solutions. And now just going to finish up on, on two projects from I uh, different ends of the South Downs National Park uh, at different scales. This first one is for um, th is the Brighton Downs, 20 square miles of, um, of downland that Brighton bought 100 years ago to protect its water supply. Those leases are all coming up for, um, for renewal at the moment. And so how those leases are going to be framed is pretty crucial uh, um, in terms of how that land will be managed for the next 100 years. And, and this is where looking beyond the fence and understanding farming at a landscape scale really makes a difference. So each, each farmer, um, it, this, is, this is the kind of scale of the landscape, these amazing chalk downs and then the weald beyond a completely different landscape. And, and particularly the northeast facing slopes are um, uh, amazing in terms of the wildflowers and the biodiversity. And grazed and managed properly, these chalk downs, I think, are amongst the most biodiverse habitats in the entire world. Uh, they are absolutely incredible, t uh, just in terms of f flowers, insects, and mycorrhizal uh, um, fungi. And so, at the moment, um, an awful lot of it looks like this. And, and you can see the um, harvesting going on on a very steep slope there. And each tenancy is saying, well, we need to have a mix of arable as well as pasture. But because of the way that the tenancy boundaries are formed, um, you're getting very artificial um, uh, management of that land. And in the reframing of the tenancies, we can look beyond the fence and say, OK, you, you've only got um, these steep slopes. We're going to make uh, an allowance with your neighbor so that instead of having um, that, that wonderful slope cut through by, um, by wheat, um, and indeed these kinds of property boundaries, tenancy boundaries that you get there, we can remanage and reframe the landscape so that you're getting um, complete uh, topographic continuity of the, um, the pasture and then having arable either in the valley bottoms or on the, on, on the headlands at the top so that you can really frame that whole management and farming of the landscape at, at a landscape scale. And so this 
this was my plan for that whole, um, it's probably covering about 30 square miles. And so instead of the, um, the regimented plan that you just saw of Toby's, which is all um, according to uh, property boundaries, you begin to get a much more wiggly pattern that follows the topography and links up and, um, and follows the framing of the, um, the, whole, the whole landscape. And, and just in a, a sort of halfway, bet well, uh, between that and the, the, the tiny bit at the end um, is Old Winchester Hill, which is the most fantastic um, Paleolithic um, uh, landscape there. And you can see how the archaeology really shines out at the top and how the woodland works with the topography there. But on the southern edge of that, um, there is um, the land has been carved up much more for arable. And you maybe can't see this, so I'll, I'll try, and try and point it out. But um, at the top here, you can see um, how the woodland has been broken um, and, and plowed up through there. And this was my um, attempt. You can see there's a really nice little bowl there and, and a, a gap between those woodlands. If one were to plant that and around there and turn that to pasture, you get something that looks much more like this, really bringing out the shape of the landscape and bringing the woodland to um, completely link up and, and flow with that. And, and then the final bit is our, our tiny small holding at the far end of the South Downs National Park, which was um, I I essentially... Uh, okay. Okay. Can you hear me now? <laughs> Great. Um, so I won't be able to point at this one then, but um, you can see the, um, the old tithe map on the left-hand side, which shows cleverly uh, wood, which was one of the Bishop of Winchester's big um, oak woodlands, um, which on the right-hand side, after the Second World War, was completely felled. And so what had gone from being um, a, a, an assarted um, landscape of, of woodland and, and some um, pasture and arable became a huge 80, 90 acre field of just um, no trees whatsoever. And if you look at the topography there, you can see uh, there's a green outline that shows the shape of our small holding, but the way that the valleys flow down through that towards the, the sea there, you get really distinctive shapes. And on the right-hand one there, you can see even those dimples, which um, are possibly Iron Age dew ponds that I actually didn't know um, were um, there. But when it came to planting the woodland there, I just followed the very subtle topography through there and, and planted according to those and then started making, uh, remaking dew ponds in the, in the dips. And um, on the left is the, the woodland that then followed that topography. And having just um, put in for a uh, higher level or higher tier st stewardship, um, they sent back this archaeological map, which shows, without knowing it, I, I had actually um, followed exactly what had been there pretty much from the Iron Age onwards. And it is, you just have to follow the very subtle shapes within the, uh, within the land and let where you plant the woodland, where you put the water, how you manage the pasture and the arable to flow at that scale with the topography. And so the top one is the, the landscape um, before I managed to get that field. You can see a tiny little tree in the foreground and the strip of, um, uh, uh, what, what, what's it, sort of, the horribly, the western red cedar that had been put in by the previous landowner for um, shooting. And then the one below it, you can see the trees a bit bigger and all the tubes that I've planted there. And then that's how it, uh, how it works now. And, and how what did feel like a very flat, open, dead landscape is now framed with the valley that flows down to the, to the sea and the Isle of Wight. And from the air, you can, you can see how that's all beginning to knit together. And you can pretty much glimpse where 
field boundaries still need replanting. But if you follow those, the archaeology, um, the field patterns, and the topography, it's a really good indication about how you can work with your neighbours to get a landscape scale of farming back. And, and I hope that that cooperation, that understanding of, of history and scale is a way that we can start getting the wider public to understand that landscape and farming are the same thing and need to be supported in the same way. And we really welcome questions. Thank you very much. There's a guy just, just here with his hand up. Oh. oh, yeah, okay. Do you want to go there first? Oh, hi, Owen. Um, is it on? Yeah. yeah. Um, I just wanted to ask a question about intervention. When is intervention right and when, it, when is it not right? There seems to be a reluctance, particularly amongst, for instance, the Environment Agency, and Kim made reference to having to persuade the Environment Agency to allow a degree of inter intervention in the Hampshire project. And Toby, I don't know how much intervention you've had to do in the, the Torridge project, but there is a there seems to be, I, I, intervention seems frowned upon, and the project that I'm working on was a marsh that was drained around 1800 with some very deep man-made ditches to take the water away, and the only way we're going to get, the, we're gonna get it's now arable, we're going to try and restore it to permanent pasture and wetland, but the only way you're going to get the water back in that marsh is to intervene because the deep ditches otherwise would just carry it away, but there's a sort of reluctance to allow it generally, and I just wondered, Great, great question. Um, uh, and I think intervention, uh, as you say, has got a dirty, uh, dirty connotation now because there is this notion that if you just took human beings out of the picture and let it look after itself, everything would be fine. But it's missing the point that the landscape that we have has been managed by human beings for 5,000 years and that intervention with knowledge and sensitivity is is what landscape is about. Uh, and so uh, I think it's, the idea is not that we shouldn't intervene, but that we should do it really knowingly, sensitively, and with respect for all life and growing food all at the same time. Yeah, I think I, think I would agree, you know, hugely with that. And, and also to say about that, that project on the Torridge, for example, the, the overall catchment system has been utterly changed by intervention for probably about 70 to 100 years, but, but actually probably far, far longer, considering in, in Devon, where we live, the amount of, of drainage which has been cut into the land. And even the old hedge boundary systems, if you look at them, any one of them that has typically in our neck of the woods some kind of uh, sinuous flow is probably where people have noticed a slight depression in the landscape and have generally put the hedge bank there, which was dug to create drainage. And then those hedge banks have then become exceptionally biodiverse and species rich over time and are now celebrated. But they were literally just the, the cut from the, from the um, or the fill rather, from the cut of trying to get water away from the land to farm. And in the case of the Torridge, in most cases in the upper Torridge, you're, you're quite literally climbing down into the river, you know, sometimes 10 or 15 feet. And in most cases, to reenact or reactivate or, or, or activate in a different way the, plod the floodplain, you need to make a balanced decision about how much of the actual river itself do you want to change in order to get water back onto the floodplain more regularly. And to know that also you've got sort of in this particular case, negative inhibitors trying to constantly scour out the river from the landscapes above you. This is why projects where you start to look at a catchment scale can really come together because you can start to make interventions which I think in the Torridge's case are absolutely vital. And I think in the case of you know the Marsh Project is also vital because in most cases, especially considering climate change, we need to actually raise the water table of a lot of Britain again because once upon a time, most of it was actually really wet and as a consequence, probably holding far more carbon than today. And so in the floodplains, where that wetness would obviously maintain fertility, it seems a really logical decision for there to be, in some cases, quite considerable intervention. But once again, just like 
Kim said, we 100% need to make sure that we're not, you know, just bulldozing in there and creating problems downstream. But I think with the right logic and the right kind of narrative towards the reason why you're deciding to do these projects, then it's a really important thing to suggest that intervention is actually just like any other generation who have come and done things in the land. And, you know, we don't have straight tusked elephants anymore battering down huge areas of forest. You know, we are in some cases the kind of proxy for that. And, and actually biodiversity in some cases was built um, like that. And, th and then, you know, we perpetuated it further. So we shouldn't be afraid of it. Uh, thank you. Uh, my question is around um, tension, if there is ever a tension between functionality and beauty. Um, and if we look at the history of the landscape, there's been functional intervention or intervention that's been driven by functionality and there's been interventions that's been driven by aesthetics. And I wonder if you have a view on whether if you had to make a choice, you should favor functionality over aesthetics or whether if aesthetics is a stronger outcome, you can twist the functionality to get to that, uh, to get to that point. I actually don't think there's a tension between functionality and aesthetics. I think what is functional is beautiful. And, and where things have been done purely for aesthetics, they look shallow and um, tawdry. I, the landscapes I showed at the beginning are, uh, that I think are some of the most beautiful in Britain are entirely the result of functional farming. And so I think functional farming that's done with a real understanding of how the land works, how you can get food uh, out of it for centuries is intrinsically beautiful. And, and I think there shouldn't be a tension between function and aesthetics. What is, what really works well is what's beautiful. Yeah, um, I completely agree. And I think that there, I think when one has a very simplistic concept or, or, or a linear management strategy where from a from an ecosystem perspective you're not calculating the overall needs of a landscape then 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 one could claim that functionality is occurring through for example creating a huge square arable field and farming it but by doing that you're essentially needing uh, you, you create the the parasite of landscape which is that 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 arable field if it's managed you know in a very mechanized way for a long time will no longer be a, an ecological unit and subsequently will then need other pieces of landscape to deliver it. And therefore, in my eyes, that's not necessarily beautiful. And so um, there's actually an incredible TED talk about the role of beauty as an evolutionary element within our very being. And if you watch that TED talk, I, I, I don't know whether the slides are going to be shared, but I'll try and get it over. Essentially, this... Um, this evolutionary psychologist argues that the the most beautiful things are the most functional because we recognize so much value from them. And I think as you start to look at the landscape from a, a much more broad perspective, you start to see oversimplification, which is not beautiful. And once you have all of the component parts of landscape re-embedded back together, it's impossible to sort of say how you feel but you have this unbelievable kind of feeling of comfort and once you start to think like that you realize that 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 that, that, that very simplistic idea of function has actually been kind of hijacked and um that's how i that's how i look at, at how it's how, how it gets formed yeah here you go. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you both for that inspiring and hope-inducing uh, delivery. Uh, my question is, what advice would you give to a landowner who doesn't have access to your skill sets or possibly de particularly deep pockets? How would he um, approach this question? Thank you. Um, 
that's a that's a good question and i think that the the greatest designers are are always people who live in their landscape and and uh, when i say live in their landscape i mean they they are at one with it and so i don't think it's beyond the realm realms of possibility for everybody in here to to be great designers of their landscapes they just need to potentially walk in a certain way through the land and feel it out and i promise you it'll it'll be there for you so you know anyone can do it <laughs> oh, it's still not working. So. I move, maybe. Is that oh, better? There you go. It's I, on, should, yeah. I should perhaps apologise for this question. I live in a, a very fine uh, northeast Scotland designed landscape with ancient woodlands. It's only been farmed for 350 years, but it, it has a high biodiversity and is utterly wonderful. How do I persuade the all-powerful utility company in pursuit of rather outrageous net zero goals to smash it all up uh, with a line of vast marching pylons? I should add that this same threat is also in the wonderful Howe of the Merns, all across northeast Scotland, Mauritia, and all the way up to the Spittal in Caithness. Would you have any advice on how we confront these bastards? <laughs> That's all you, Kim. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> it is... I, I, I think what, what's going to be really painful is in this transition to, to good sense, um, we're going to make a lot of mistakes. And, and I think one of the things that's going to transform how we live on the land um, I is storing energy rather than generating it and at the moment we have uh, as soon as we have domestic batteries that are um, sustainable we won't need all of those great cables crossing the land we won't need the grid we'll be able to generate energy locally store it locally and, and we're going to regret an awful lot of the um, pylons that we've put in in the interim. But I guess we have to get there, uh, and it's going to break an awful lot of eggs on, on the way of getting there. Um, so, good luck. <laughs> yeah. Um, I've never had to take on something like that, to be honest, so I don't necessarily have any really, really good advice, but I think I think creating a story around, once again, the a more powerful logic than the simplistic need to transfer power, and 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 what is being lost is. Well, actually, that's I do have a bit of experience with that. There's this amazing cable car that's going up through a place that I've been visiting for about 30 years. Um, amazing to everybody in the valley because it might bring lots of economic opportunity, but. But but at a, at a at a at a cost I think that is too high for the valley's, um, to, to the valley's culture, and and the culture has been retained really strongly by the people in the village, and I think that if one can pull together a a logic of why it's not necessary, or that it should go underground, then that's the best way of changing people's views because by just saying oh that's going to be really ugly. Uh, we've got lots of examples of by saying it's going to be ugly, it just then gets built. So it needs to be a story that's powerful enough for people to sit up and go, wow, I didn't realise what we were really spoiling. So that's what I would say. Any more? Cool. Well, well thank you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs>